Great, thanks a lot. My name is uh, Hatem Al Tayef. I'm a research scientist at KAUST, and I'll be the chair of this session um, on parallel numerical methods and application. We have three talks today. Um, so let's get started. Our first talk is about efficient ephemeris models for spacecraft trajectory simulations on GPUs. And the speaker is Fabian. So, all right. of Darmstadt and the welcome everyone. My name is Fabian Schrammel and together with my colleagues from the Technical University of Darmstadt and the European Space Agency, I would like to introduce you to our research on ephemeris models applied on GPUs. Ephemeris models are used to calculate the trajectory of spacecrafts within astrodynamic simulations. The movement of spacecrafts within our solar system is primarily defined by gravity. Each body exerts a gravitational force on each other, which leads to multiple accelerations affecting the spacecraft's future trajectory. Slightly different initial states for the spacecraft can cause a very different trajectory in the long run. What here first looks like a similar orbit changes tremendously as the distance to the blue planet is very different for these spacecrafts. Now we see one spacecraft turn to the planet while the others drift away. The European Space Agency has several requirements for spacecraft missions, like for example planetary protection guidelines to prevent contamination of bodies like Mars, or to mitigate space debris in critical regions like the low Earth orbit. In order to meet these requirements, possible trajectories are analyzed. The initial states are generated using the Monte Carlo method. In the presented example, we perceivate a spacecraft after launch. It will become debris and drift out into space. The point in time, position and speed, however, are only known with a certain precision. And thus, we create this cloud of samples to simulate instead. One GPU thread is started to handle each of these samples. And step by step, their trajectories are simulated accordingly. Here, we detect collisions with celestial bodies. And probabilistic result can now be calculated from this data. We detected four collisions out of 13 samples. This results in an impact probability of 30.8% for this specific planned initial state. This is a lot, which is why the requirement is violated. The trajectories of all celestial bodies are approximated with polynomials to take small deviations into account. This black line represents a small part of a planet's orbit. Chebyshev polynomials of high order are applied by modern mo models to achieve high accuracy during astrodynamic simulations. The ephemeris model contains a set of these polynomials, each providing an approximation for one specific body during a specific time frame. Within this model, they are sorted by time. Here we have polynomials for Sun, Uranus and Pluto. The polynomials describing the position during the first 32 days are packed in the first record. We see that we actually store two Sun polynomials, each for 16 days, in order to achieve the desired accuracy. This way of storing the polynomial data becomes an issue. The CUDA threads about to simulate the spacecraft samples are grouped into warps, executing the same instruction. In this example, all samples start at time zero, but will choose to simulate a slightly different step size. When they proceed, they diverge in simulation time. At step seven, the simulation timestamps will reach a range of 54 days, as each a polynomial record covers 32 days, two different sets of polynomials will be required for the next step. For the Bepi Colombo case, we observe a range of 120 days for each step in each warp on average. High deviation of the simulation time 
leads to significant increase of data load, which is the cause for our main performance issue. The requirements to load more data per step first leads to longer thread stalls and second spills the register data to off-chip memory. This makes it very expensive to reload and resume these threads. To improve the performance, we need to reduce the memory traffic. This we try to achieve by first improve the data locality and second by reducing the overall memory consumption. So let's adjust the data locality. In order to do so, we will have a look at how the ephemeris data is used by a CPU thread. In the following example, the thread will calculate the positions for all three bodies. It starts at the second Sun polynomial and will then load three polynomials. This order is the optimal storage for one thread. On a GPU, however, we need to optimize for one instruction executed by all threads of a warp in parallel. So instead, we sort them first by body and then by time. This will be called the cube format in the following. Here, the current timestamps range over 64 days. The threads will now request data for four different Sun polynomials, but those will be stored next to each other. When the threads apply their polynomials, they end up requesting data from cache lines already loaded for other threads, which reduces the overall number of loads and stall time. In order to reduce the overall memory consumption, we introduce some alternative ephemeris models and configurations. We investigated three aspects for this. First, we can exclude specific celestial bodies from the model. This is a widespread approach and with a simple check, we can be sure to only exclude those with an impact below a predefined accuracy level. Second, we can skip calculating the position of the Moon in many simulation steps by abstracting the Earth-Moon system as one body. And third, we introduce cubic splines as cheap alternative to the original polynomials. While Cherbyshev polynomials approximate the real trajectory very well, cubic splines provide a good trade-off between data requirements and accuracy but we see that their approximation can be far off in comparison, which introduces a big error. But if the simulated spacecraft is far away, this error may be small enough to be accepted. Now let's have a look at how these models perform. The ephemeris model can be trimmed down heavily. Here we save half of the data loads in each step, and if we are far away from the moon, another big chunk can be skipped. Most of the data is saved from excluding five bodies. But the Sun's trajectory is approximated by cubic splines, reducing the data per polynomial by a factor of 5.5 and stretching the polynomial time period, which increases the reuse of this data. Cubic splines are also applied for Jupiter. Here the original polynomials are already of lower order, but we are able to increase the polynomials period by a factor of almost 25. So most of the threads will request the same data. We applied some artificial test cases to observe the performance at specific timestamp ranges per warp. First of all, we investigated a zero days range. EMB abstraction gives a speed up of around 1.1 which is expected as one of 11 bodies is excluded by this change. The cube format alone gives a free speed up of 1.5 without losing any accuracy, which is very positive. The cubic splines on top are not able to improve, but excluding about half of the bodies gives a speed up of over two. And combining all changes gives a speed up of about 2.3. When we raise the timestamp range per warp to 64 days, the original analysis takes longer, but we see about the same speed up. We also see an increased speed up of all changes, so we can say that this worse 
test case can be improved even more. We also applied the Pepe Colombo case. We observe smaller speedups for the tested accuracy levels because this case includes additional physics models that are not affected by this change. But these are still positive results. For detailed investigation, we apply the profiler to the Pepe Colombo case. We see that the ephemeris model alone is improved even more. As expected, the number of ephemeris data requests was not changed by the cube format. Instead, we reduced the overall traffic to local memory where the registers are spilled to. And by reducing this register spilling, we also improve the hit rate on the cache. Applying only the cubic splines on top gives us a minor runtime improvement. But we see the number of ephemeris data requests drop by almost a third. The cache hit rate is also improved tremendously. Both of these observations are tied to the cubic splines increasing the reuse of data. Unfortunately, the extra logic of supporting two different types of polynomials also increases register spilling. When we exclude five of the 11 bodies, we reduce all types of memory accesses, including register spilling. The cache hit rate, however, also drops significantly, as now mostly polynomials of shorter time periods are left, which reduces data reuse. To conclude this presentation, we have a look on what we achieved. The main issue of trajectory simulations on GPUs is the high data load when the simulation time diverges. This causes extensive register spilling. The cube format can decrease this effect by adjusting the spatial locality and achieves a good speed up. Cubic splines increase the data reuse, but also register spilling, while exclusion and EMB abstraction reduce both algorithmic effort and data loads. In total, speedups of up to 2.62 are achieved for lower accuracy models. Thank you a lot for watching and have a nice day. All right, thanks Fabian for the talk. All right, so let's see uh, if we have a question on the channel. Um, all right, here we go, we have one. Fabian, are you there? I am here, yes. Okay, all right, so here's a question. Could you give an overview of the order of magnitude of the runtime of the simulations? Um, so, um, the so how, how case I mentioned um, okay. is for um, for um, mid-range uh, uh, accelerators. It is at um, I think that was like um, 500 seconds plus, and on a um, high-end accelerator, we uh, drop that. Uh, we uh, reduce that to about. 100 seconds so it's uh, and uh, but um, the type of cal uh, calculations varies a lot or the, the type of analysis so we have everything from several seconds to um, an hour no 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 maybe not an hour but half an hour very good okay um have a question for you um so um you know, you use lower accuracy model, and it's you know your, your your at the end your accuracy. I mean your the accuracy that you get from your application seems to be tolerant to uh, the error budget that you may um, have with uh, the domain scientist. I was wondering whether you looked at uh, opportunities to use, for instance, uh, mixed precision computation. You know, instead of excluding some um, information or data. Uh, that uh, uh, you know impact your application. Have you looked uh, instead at at using you know mixed precision computation to mitigate uh, um, you know to mitigate the um, the accuracy that you get at the end? Um, uh, are you talking about single precision instead of double precision? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so we experience uh, too low uh, accuracy for single precision. So this is not an option at ESA, ex at least for the simulations they, they are performing. So we are, um, yeah, we are, we need to use double precision here. Okay. All right. All right. So let's see. I have another question for you. Um, uh, so this is on single GPU, right? This is my understanding. You show yes. result on single GPUs. Um, can you comment on uh, result on multiple GPUs as far as performance or whether even your technique can be extended to multiple GPUs? This whole approach is very scalable also on CPUs. So um, in theory, we can also uh, have heterogeneous um, um, yeah, simulations. Th simply uh, throw every hardware you have on the problem at the same time and uh, just um, uh, yeah, distribute the different samples on every uh -huh. core you have. So everything is possible here. Okay, uh, we have a follow-up question on the first one. Um, so how do you account for the reduced accuracy in practice, given that the results are very sensitive? Yeah, we have, um, we realized that other factors in the simulations like um, preconditions of the uh, used um, ephemeris models or um, of the inter um, numerical integration method actually have higher uh, error rates, uh, if you want to say it like that, uh, than the accuracy we are actually providing. So it turns out we can uh, easily uh, switch to lower accuracy models without having a big impact as the method already introduces errors much higher. And um, I forgot my second point. <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, maybe uh, let, let me ask you another question. Perhaps it will refresh a bit your mind since we still have some time here. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you know uh, you've seen the problem when you profile the code that you know you need to reduce memory traffic uh, looking at uh, data locality uh, you know techniques and uh, trying also to reduce memory consumption right can you can you comment on on the latest point here on on the memory consumption i, I can't recall whether on your slide you mentioned something about it maybe i have uh, overlooked that it yeah so with regards to memory consumption Yes, um, so for example, uh, using cubic splines in instead of the original very high order polynomials, uh, we oh, definitely reduce the memory consumption because for the same cal calculation, or well, not the same calculation, but for the same task, we need much less data. Okay, got it. All right. Okay, let's see if there are another question on the Slack. Uh, no, at this time. Okay. Um, I guess uh, we we move to the next talk. Thanks, Fabian, again. Thank you. Thank you. So our next uh, talk um, is about multi-precision block Jacobi for iterative triangular solves, and this will be given by Fritz Gobel. Fritz, are you there? I'm here, yes. All right, great. We can get started with the second talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Fritz. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And today I will be talking to you about multi-precision block Jacobi for iterative triangular solves. I have been working on this with Hartwig, Terry, Gorin, and Enrique. We look at the solution of sparse linear systems AX equals B. The one that we see here has already been preconditioned with some uh, matrix M to the minus 1. 
The idea of having a preconditional is to approximate the inverse of A in order to, while well, the system is still uh, equivalent to the initial system, um, make it easier to solve for an iterative method. Now, the preconditional that we concentrated on for this work is a incomplete LU um, factorization, meaning uh, we factorize A into uh, a lower triangular matrix L and an upper triangular matrix U. The one that we used is an ILU0, so they should have the same sparsity pattern of A. And we require that LU on the sparsity pattern of A has the same entries as A. Where A has zeros, LU can, does what it want, uh, can do what it wants, we don't care. That's why it's an incomplete factorization. Applying this preconditional, so multiplying m to the minus 1 to a vector v in order to get the preconditioned vector v hat, now means uh, having to solve two triangular systems. First, LW equals V, and with the solution of that, to get the preconditioned vector solving U V hat equals W. As in highly parallel architectures like GPUs, the exact solution of sparse triangular systems is very expensive. The question arises if there might be an alternative that might be faster. And as the ILU factorization already only is an approximation on the inverse of A, why not solve it approximately? Now the idea is to do that with uh, Jacobi relaxation. Specifically to combine the adaptive precision implementation of a block Jacobi preconditional that's present in the Ginkgo open source library with an iterative refinement method and combine these to a block Jacobi relaxation which then will be used as an approximate triangular solver inside the ILU preconditional. Let me explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, first, let's look at the block Jacobi preconditioner of L. Uh, we do the same for U, we concentrate on L here. The block Jacobi preconditioner is uh, simply a block diagonal submatrix of A, and the, the adaptive precision version in Ginkgo now looks at each of these blocks and computes the uh, condition number. With this information, we can then determine by how much we can reduce the precision in which each block is stored without the block becoming singular. By doing this, we can reduce memory transfer volume uh, in, uh, when reading the preconditioner from memory, and therefore, hopefully, we can save runtime. Now, the iterative refinement method starts with some initial guess x and computes the residual r equals b minus lx. Then it computes some approximate solution c to lc equals r and adds it to x. How c is computed, however, uh, is our choice. We really repeat this until we're happy with the solution. If we now simply define c to be p minus 1 to, uh, times r, so applying the block Jacobi preconditioner to the residual, we reach the recurrence x equals x plus p to the minus 1 times b minus lx, and we can easily transform this to p to the minus 1 times p minus lx plus p to the minus 1b. And this is exactly the definition of a block Jacobi relaxation method. So, to sum up, we can reuse the optimized adaptive precision block Jacobi preconditioner implementation 
that is already present in the Ginkgo open source library with an iterative refinement method in order to get a block Jacobi relaxation method which we can use in, uh, to solve the triangular systems arising in incomplete factorization preconditioning. Let's look how that behaves. Let's look at some results. First, uh, look at the triangular solver performance. On the left side, we see the time to solution for an increasing number of block Jacobi sweeps on the incomplete Koleski factors of the matrix thermal 1 from the Suitsbus matrix collection. We see that for up to some 28 sweeps, the adaptive precision block Jacobi displayed in blue is faster than the exact triangular solve, the solid black line. On the right, we see the relative residual. With iterative refinement, uh, with iterative triangular solves, we reach the same solution quality as with a direct solve if we do 20 or more sweeps. Uh, by the way, the orange line is the exact same iterative approach, but uh, in double. So no adaptive precision, just only doubles. So we can already see some kind of a window here. We reach the same quality as the direct solve already with 20 sweeps and we are faster to 28 sweeps. Now, when we plug this approach into the preconditioner of the conjugate gradient method, we see the following. On the left side, it is clear that when doing only a few uh, block Jacobi sweeps uh, to solve the triangular systems, uh, the preconditioner quality um, is much worse than when doing a direct triangular solves, as we need much more uh, CG iterations. This gets um, amor amortized when we do enough um, sweeps. As we uh, saw before, we reach a similar quality. Now on the right hand side we see that even if we only do a few block Jacobi sweeps, we are still much faster than when doing uh, direct triangular solves. Also on the right hand side we can see that when we increase the number of block Jacobi sweeps, uh, the gap between fixed precision and adaptive precision block Jacobi uh, gets wider. That makes sense as when we do more block Jacobi sweeps we spend more time in the uh, triangular solves which is where reducing memory volume gives us runtime benefits. Okay, of course we didn't only test for this one problem and the effectiveness of the iterative approach is problem dependent. When looking at a smaller problem uh, for which the direct triangular solve does well, we simply can't compete. Now, we need some kind of uh, choice, a default choice for the number of sweeps uh, to make this actually a practical uh, option. So we looked at 24 different uh, symmetric positive definite problems from different areas and looked at the, op uh, the, the optimal number of sweeps uh, in optimal in the regard that they minimize the CG runtime. That is the left bar plot here. Clearly this varies widely and gives us no uh, clue on how to choose. That is why we decided to uh, compute a softmax function uh, over the runtimes and take the minimum of that. Doing this gives us a default choice of 19 block Jacobi sweeps per CG iteration uh, and using 19 block Jacobi sweeps for 24 problems now gives us the following. On the left hand side we see that for about half of the problems we get quite significant speedups over using direct triangular solves 
And on the right hand side, we see the speed up of adaptive versus fixed precision block Jacobi, which is for many problems negligible, but for some, it gives us up to 8% of speed up. And as using the adaptive precision block Jacobi is literally one line of extra code in Ginkgo, these eight, uh, up to 8% are basically for free. Okay, uh, this. Yes, this already brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for watching. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and ask in the Q&A session. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Fritz, for the talk. So let's see if we have a question. Uh, I have someone typing. Um, in the meantime, I had a uh, couple questions here for you. Um, so um, for the adaptive precision block Jacobi that you use, um, so what are the precision that you actually use there? I mean, did you move from uh, double down to single and down to half? Uh, we use six different types of precisions. Uh, okay. So the IEEE standard uh, double, single, and half, and then okay. a custom format where we simply uh, Cut, cut the significant uh, of a double um, off the, the, the last 32 bits are cut off and the same for single. And then for each of the, uh, for each of the several uh, diagonal blocks, we compute the, um, the condition number and compare it with the unit roundoffs of the different precisions and we use the cheapest possible one. I see. On which system uh, were you running? Uh, these were run on a uh, Volta V100. Got it. Okay. Very good. Um, let's see if we have a question on Slack. I don't want to take all the. Okay. Someone is still typing there, so let me uh, ask uh, perhaps uh, another question. Um, so, uh, uh, do you have a systematic approach in you know identifying when uh, you know to switch uh, precision at runtime? How do you you know what are the mechanisms in place to do that? So, uh, my understanding is it's very simple as a user to turn on this feature within Ginkgo library, and uh, I was. Uh, more interested in, in learning a bit more internally how, you know, what is the mechanism in place to, to do that in a systematic way? Uh, yes, so we have all these, we have, we have all these blocks, we define a block size um, beforehand. Uh, for this, uh, for these experiments, we mostly used uh, 16 as a block size. And then uh, the blocks are specifically inverted as the and they are really small and uh, with batched routines that is uh, pretty fast. And the preconditioner is the inverse of the block diagonal. So we both have the, um, the, the, the block and the inverse of the block. So uh -huh. these two, we can easily compute the condition number of each block. And um, the condition number uh, times the unit round off uh, gives us a wait. Is that true? I see. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not a uh, hundred percent uh, sure right now. But the condition number and the unit round off of the several precisions um, are compared to uh, decide which precision we can use. Uh, and for we use different precision for every blocks uh, for every block, and these are only used to store the the preconditioner. Um, in memory, and all the calculations are always done in double. I see. So uh, another question: You uh, during the convergence and the, the iterative procedure, you not, never diverge, right? You never hit a bad situation where uh, you know you either don't converge or converge slow um, than than if you were to do uh, things in uh, normal precision. Uh, no. So that is, uh, 
that is the approach by uh, that is the idea behind the approach of uh, computing each condition number uh, of each block separately. Uh -huh. So uh, we can guarantee that it, it works in the precision that we choose. Got it. All right, let me go to uh, the question from Slack. Um, what were the system sizes that were used? So the sizes of the system. Uh, let me look that up. The system sizes varied widely. And let me see, uh, they varied from uh, some 5,000 to uh, multiple hundred thousand. Uh, and then the number of non zeros varied from something like 17,000 to uh, three and a half million. Very good. Um, another question uh, from Slack again. Um, how are the blocks chosen? How are the blocks chosen? Uh, they are chosen with super variable amalgamation. Uh, if you, uh, if there is a suggestion for um, a more sophisticated uh, approach to choosing the blocks, uh, we are very happy um, to discuss that. But uh, Yes. Very good. Let's see. Um, great. So let me ask you another question. So you run on V100. Um, so have you looked at AMD GPU? Uh, yes. Have you looked but at I... uh, running? Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, we have run the block Jacobi. The adaptive precision block Jacobi as a preconditioner itself on um, I think a Radeon 7 and there it gives uh, I think about 20% speed up uh, in, on average um, but we have not used it inside ILU preconditioning yet on the Radeon 7. So um... Uh, did you use HIP for this or? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, which perhaps also lead me to another question a bit uh, related to the topic. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, you started, I guess, developing this adaptive um, uh, precision block Jacobi uh, on, on NVIDIA with CUDA. Um, and then you took it to, uh, you know, AMD uh, GPU using HIP. Um, so would you start, you know, developing things on NVIDIA with CUDA or, and then move eventually to, to AMD with, um, you know, using HIP or, you know, start doing things on HIP <laughs> directly, I mean, for AMD uh, GPU and eventually, uh, uh, you know, plug back again, you know, your implementation to NVIDIA. I mean, which way is perhaps the most um, productive as far as you can tell in the context of your work here? Uh, that is a very uh, that is a very good question, and um, I can't give you a, a real answer to that because uh, basically most of our code was there on uh, Nvidia, and then we ported it to HIP. I see. And I see. so at the moment, as the as the kernels um, can basically reuse be reused one uh, one to one. Uh, you just develop your kernels, and you call it you call them differently from. NVIDIA or uh, AMD GPUs. So you can reuse a lot of code. I see. Very good. All right. have a, yet again another question, a small one. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, uh, perhaps it's related to uh, the presentation that uh, uh, Enrique uh, uh, Quintana Orti made uh, at the Eto Ropar uh, workshop a couple of days ago. Um, so this adaptive multi precision, you applied it on iterative triangular solves. Um, I guess you applied it also on other, uh, you know, sparse, uh, you know, matrix uh, computation or kernel, right? And uh, what, what are your? Can you comment on this further? Can you perhaps share some of your experience or maybe result that you got on other kernel besides the iterative triangular solves? 
Uh, yes, so um, we have uh, we have this ad adaptive precision block Jacobi preconditioner that works pretty well. That gives it gives around um, twenty percent uh, speed up in average, and uh, the the main idea behind the uh, adaptive precision approach in Ginkgo is to drastically decouple the format in which we store data, which is the reduced format, and um, the format in which we um, compute, which is uh, always like the, the, the highest precision uh, we use at the moment, so uh, mostly double. And um, we have another, um, another method. We have a compressed basis GMRES which stores the Krylov basis in reduced precision. And at the moment in the making is a uh, data accessor scheme, which uh, makes this accessible to all the other servers as well. Uh, but there are not, not really results for that one yet. I see. So and all this work you mentioned is um, already deployed or I mean integrated into Ginkgo, right? To the library in Ginkgo. Uh, so it's um, it, it, uh, yeah. it is not yet in the master branch, okay. uh, but there is another there's a yes, there is a talk actually today uh, on the accessor scheme in the Exascale computing project. And that will be deployed very soon. Yeah, I think it should be uh, okay. it should be available on GitHub already, but I'm not entirely sure. That's fine. Sounds good. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Fritz. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the great talk, and congratulations again on your paper. Thank you very All much right, for so your questions. We... Thank you. So we proceed with um, the next uh, talk and the last talk of the session. So um, the talk